Hello students and welcome to my review video on instructional segment four of the Living Earth NGSS curriculum out of California on inheritance of traits. Many students' favorite unit, it's always fascinating to learn about DNA and genetics. And I really, really hope you see how DNA and genetics all go together and how they're all tied to evolution. Just like all my videos, this is not for profit. This is completely free and meant to help uh, students here at TASM and any other students that might stumble across it on the interwebs. Here we have a cell and here is the nucleus and inside the nucleus will be chromosomes. Chromosomes are made up of DNA wrapped around histone proteins. This DNA is the code of life. And so the structure of DNA leads to its function. We saw an amazing TED video about how similar our DNA is between people but then how there's also differences and it leads to the great diversity in organisms on earth. Let's jump in. Here are your standards, the NGSS standards. And I like how they're different than in the past, right? They say things like ask questions to clarify relationships. So wanting you to really dig deep and think critically, and this will be really important as the technology around DNA and genetics keeps improving and changing things like CRISPR, that are coming out. You will need to be able to ask those questions about how they work and then think about the bioethics involved with them. And then lastly, we need to be able to construct an explanation for how the structure of DNA determines the structure of proteins. We did a lot in this class. Um, we spent a fair amount of time on that, and I hope you feel comfortable going from DNA to RNA to protein. Here in, in my classroom, in Google Classroom, are some links to help you out. Um, I have visuals, so the videos from the Amoeba Sisters, and I've listed them out um, by topic, DNA and genetics. And then if you're more of a reader to get help, um, we have a virtual textbook this year due to COVID on DNA and genetics from CK12. And then my study guide and my videos will be linked here, and I'll also post them uh, separately as I finish them. So here we go. Our phenomena that we really looked at with this uh, unit on DNA was the boy in the bubble. In years past, I've done uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and other uh, diseases, but uh, this I found this retro report and I found it fascinating to watch to learn about David Vetter's life. Uh, it was very sad, but um, you all approached it with uh, dignity and um, curiosity and how can you help people like David here um, and continue his legacy. David had a form of severe combined immunodeficiency on the X chromosome. And so those are all things that should sound familiar now that you've um, done the DNA and the genetics unit, and especially since you did the Explore Learning Gizmo on SCID. Your Explore Learning Gizmo did a different form of SCID on an autosome, I believe it was uh, chromosome number 20, um, where there was a deficiency in an enzyme that helps to clean up toxins in the cell. This one it tends to affect boys more often because it's on the X chromosome, right? And boys only have one X chromosome. And the one you did in your gizmo was in an autosome, so it affected individuals half and half, uh, half girls, half boys on average. So the reason I put this in here is to remember that, you know, a gene is a stretch of DNA. It's on a chromosome. Here's the location of this one. And you all have the same genes, but you may have different forms of the genes or alleles. And in this instance, this boy, David, inherited a mutated form of this gene for, and it led it so that his uh, stem cells and his immune system cannot differentiate and make them a functioning immune system. X-linked disorders are more likely to affect sons. Here you can see, remember that a uh, son is going to get a Y from dad. And so therefore the only X he has, he'll get from mom. And so he would have a 50-50 chance. Whereas a daughter will not have the disease, she may be a carrier right? But she's going to have two X's. She's going to get one from dad and one from mom. And in this instance, because SCID is going to be a recessive excellent disease, she will not express it. She will have enough of the protein from this blue gene expressed that she will be okay. Uh, it's pretty fascinating how um, the uh, X-linked genetics work, and you can learn about it with Calico Cats in my next video. All right, so let's jump in. I told you the story of Francis Crick, James Watson, and Maurice Wilkins, uh, Raymond Gosling and Rosalind Franklin. And many of you are quite shocked that that kind of story isn't in your textbook. And so that's a, a dive into ethics and how Rosalind Franklin was treated and uh, whether or not that was right or wrong. It was wrong. And, and we should always dig beneath the surface and see what's going on. We should critically analyze the sources of information that we're learning from. 
So there is quite a march to understanding that DNA is the genetic material. Um, it, there was a lot of action going on with this. And so there were these famous experiments. This year, um, I'm not testing on the experiments, so I'm gonna breeze through those slides. But if you'd like to learn more about them, I have other videos as well. Um, but these experiments helped to show that DNA was the uh, transforming factor and not proteins. And then the structure and function of DNA was really figured out by Rosalind Franklin and Watson and Crick. So um, Hunt and Sturdivant were these geneticists and they proved that genes are on chromosomes and did a lot of work of fruit flies. But is it the protein or the DNA of the chromosomes that are genes? Many people initially thought that proteins were thought to be the genetic material and why? Pause the video and ask yourself. Hopefully you got something along the lines of there's 20 amino acids that make up proteins. So there's great diversity in proteins. Um, and so that could hold all the diversity that is our genetics. But it's not the case. It's instead going to be DNA. All right. So once again, you're not going to be testing this. So I'm going to breeze through it. But here is Griffith's experiment showing uh, transformation in a mouse. We did look at this briefly. And so here he injected this mouse with a rough strain of pneumonia. And the mouse lived. This is the mouse's immune system, which is like ours because mouse is a vertebrate, is able to defeat the rough strain. The smooth strain has an extra cap on it, and so it was able to evade the immune system and it kills them out. So rough doesn't kill it, smooth kills it. If you boil the heat, kills smooth strain. So like if we were to boil water out on one of our trips in Oman um, and drink it, we'd be okay, right? It would kill it off the pathogen. But if you mix the rough strain with the boiled smooth strain, the rough strain changes. It takes up some of the properties of the smooth strain and becomes deadly and kills the mouse. So they didn't quite know what was going on, but can you describe the claim evidence reasoning for here? And so I would say the claim is that bacteria can be transformed. And then the evidence you saw on the slide beforehand, putting the heat killed S strain with a non-harmful R strain changed it into a killer strain. Um, he didn't know what was quite going on, but today we call it transformation. It's actually a lab we do in AP biology. All right, so um, and then Avery McLeod and McCarty took this one step further and they used enzymes. Enzymes are proteins that help to catalyze reactions. And so here they added an enzyme that chops up proteins. Here they added an enzyme that chops up RNA. And here they added an enzyme that chops up DNA. They then added them to these uh, flasks to see, just like this experiment, to see if the R cells would change again. So once again, we're combining the rough with this heat killed smooth. And so what they found was that the uh, cells, even in the absence of proteins in the beaker, that the R cells still became deadly. And then if you here take away the RNA, that the R cells still become deadly. So by, uh, by deduction, if you take away the DNA, the R cells do not become deadly. How fascinating is that? The absence of DNA means that the cells were not transformed. This is really hard for students to get their mind around and for adults uh, to think about it because it's the absence of the transforming factor means that these cells were not transformed. Um, you know, I modified this for uh, uh, a ninth grade level. This is from Bio Ninja, so um, you can check it out. Um, and, and kind of see what's going on there, but it's pretty cool. If you take away the DNA, then it isn't transformed. If you take away the proteins, it still is transformed. That tells you, if you can think back uh, logically, that uh, DNA is gonna be the transforming factor. So you could pause the video and check this out, but once again, not on your test, so I need to speed on. Okay, Hershey and Chase, what an experiment. This is absolutely magnificent. So they knew that sulfur is inside of proteins. It's in cysteine and methionine and those amino acids. And phosphorus is inside of DNA. And so what they did was they grew um, bacteriophages, viruses that are going to infect bacteria inside of radioactively labeled sulfur over here in the first experiment and in radioactively labeled phosphorus over here in the second experiment. They then let them infect uh, bacteria and then they shook them off. That's why it's called the blender experiment. And then they spun the resulting bacteria cells and all of the heavy stuff in a cell, like the inside, the nucleus and everything else would be down here in the supernatant, in the pellet, and all the watery items would be up top. 
And what you see is that the radioactively labeled phosphorus was put inside the cell and it came here into the supernatant inside the pellet. And so that means that the radioactively labeled DNA is what was injected into the cell. So they got a little lucky, right? Because these uh, viruses infect cells with DNA. Some um, viruses use RNA like the coronavirus, but it works, right? And um, RNA would have worked too, right? Because RNA has phosphorus as well. And so here the radio radioactively labeled DNA is put into the bacterium and it is the transforming factor. So they also help to prove that DNA is the genetic material. All right. Um, you may wonder why I went through those if it's not on your test. It's uh, not always just what's on the test. It's trying to appreciate science and engaging in claim evidence and reasoning is really a transdisciplinary skill. If you can use that in, you know, Mr. Ellis' history class and Ms. Woods' English class, like you're on the right track. So this slide is kind of showing you that A's and T's and G's and C's are going to match up. They, they might not be exactly perfect, but they should be pretty close. And these are called Shargoff's base pairing rules. Um, and then here are the major actors. Um, the only one that's still alive is James Watson. And I told you that he has some unsavory characteristics. All right here's uh, Rosalind Franklin's famous picture of B51 uh, exposure of DNA. And this gave uh, rise to the thinking that DNA is a double helix. Okay, here are some DNA facts. So there is DNA inside the nucleus inside of a cell. And so all of the cells in your body have the same DNA. There are some exceptions with your uh, sex cells and with some of your immune cells. So you started out as one cell and it has DNA in it, and then it divided and then it divided again and it divided again and it divided again. And it went through trillions of cellular divisions, each time having the same DNA inside the cell. That DNA gives the blueprint for your life. Now, in certain cells, some genes will be activated, and in other cells, other genes will be activated. For instance, in my eye, it will activate genes associated with vision, and in my liver, it will activate genes associated with detoxification of chemicals, etc. DNA is going to be in the nucleus. It's going to be kind of like in a spaghetti-like bowl there, and then it will condense together into a chromosome during cellular division. It codes for your genes, right? A section, which are your traits, and it's remaining of repeating subunits called nucleotides. These will be the monomers or the building blocks of DNA. And the monomer is going to be a phosphate group, a sugar, and a nitrogenous base. Phosphate should sound familiar because of ATP when we learned about energy. Sugars we'll learn more about in some of our upcoming units on biochemistry. And in here is the base. For our instances, you can just remember that the bases are A's, T's, G's, and C's. They're not actually labeled as letters inside of our bodies. The A stands for an adenine molecule, T stands for thymine, G for guanine, and C for cytosine. The way that they're arranged, you can see that A's and T's are going to have two hydrogen bonds between them, and G's and C's are going to have three hydrogen bonds between them. Because of their shape, G's will always bind with C's and A's with T's. And so this uh, base pairing rule is really important for when we copy DNA. The strands of DNA are anti-parallel. This will be important if you take upper level classes, but it has what's called a five prime direction and a three prime direction. And it's just, um, it's just labeling the molecule. And so you can think about it this way in introductory biology, you can think about it as a highway. There's one strand running up and the other strand running down. That enables DNA to have the shape of the helix. If it wasn't like this, it wouldn't work, and the um, shape would be off. So they have to be anti-parallel. It took a long time to figure that out. This gives you a major and a minor groove in DNA and allows genes to be accessed in the process of transcription and translation. So for you, you just need to know that they're anti-parallel. You're kind of taking a little bit of a leap of faith there. Um, I hate to have you memorize things, but you can try and look it up if you'd like on why that it has to be anti-parallel. So this is interesting and another um, tidbit into structure and function. The bases are held together by hydrogen bonds and these are weaker bonds, right? Whereas the backbones between the sugars and the phosphates are held together by covalent bonds and those are much stronger. So the back is really strong. You're not gonna open up the back, but the inside is weaker. 
Well, that's, that sounds quite crazy, frankly, right? For our genetic information, isn't it precious? We don't want that to be mutated, right? Which is what happens when you smoke or vape or do things like that or have too much sun. But there's a good reason. And that good reason for having a weaker inside with these hydrogen bonds is that way the DNA can be opened up with an enzyme called helicase for copying, or it can be read and transcribed with an enzyme called RNA polymerase. So some terms to know, I've been mentioning this, but this a gene is a segment of DNA that codes for a protein. This is why we teach DNA and genetics together, right? So you could imagine like a stretch of um, DNA such as this would be a gene. So I showed you a couple of genes in class. And so I just recently showed you um, the RPE gene that was in the movie about genes as medicine um, that deals with photoreceptors in your eye. We saw it as like thousands of DNA letters. In it's pretty cool. Right? So the sides, once again, remember are the phosphate and the sugar and then the inside is going to be the base. The nucleotides can be in any order as long as base pairing rules are followed, which is what makes you different than your friends. But remember that you're still very similar. All right. Pause the video. Can you say what is the other side of this DNA? Can you check those base pairing rules? Okay. Hopefully you got something like this. Notice how I've set them up into groups of three. That'll be important later on when we read DNA and make codons and anticodons. All right, try this checkpoint question. Pause the video. Had to use a little deduction there, so hopefully you got it. So how the code works, right? These endless combinations result in different traits. You have the same genes, but you may have different forms of those genes. So here, purple and yellow hair for this cat. You can think about it as words and sentences and endless combinations. All right, so. Can you describe or model how the structure of DNA leads to its function? Remember that the function is to pass on hereditary information between generations. The structure of those uh, sugar phosphate backbones, nitrogenous bases, anti-parallel, etc. It's quite a question. I've uh, gone over it in your study guide. It's fascinating. And you can even extend it to how does this uh, tie into evolution, right? Because DNA is mutable. It's changeable. All right, so Watson and Crick noticed that as they discovered the structure and function of DNA, thanks to Rosalind Franklin, that it has all the information needed to make another complementary strand because of the base pairing rules. And so every time that a cell divides, it needs to copy its DNA. And so there's going to be special enzymes or proteins that help facilitate this. So let's go through it. It's going to be semi-conservative. It's going to have one old strand as the model, and then it's going to synthesize the new strand. Because A's always go with T's and G's always go to C's, these two strands will be identical to the original parent strand. If you take one old and then use base pairing rules and one new, you will get the same strands. And I, I modeled it on Zoom, but it, it was a little hard to see. So I encourage you to try this on a piece of paper. Take your paper and write out a strand of DNA split it in part, and then try and copy it again with the new strand following the base pairing rules, and you should see that it will line up. All right, so here's another example of it. Um, the purple one is the old strand. We're going to open it up with helicase. We're going to add the new strand, and because it follows the rules, they should be exact copies of each other, A's to T's and G's to C's. There can be mistakes, and there are enzymes to fix those mistakes, and sometimes those mistakes aren't fixed, and they can be passed on. And that can lead to cancer or mutations. So let's go over the steps. A couple of the enzymes. I encourage you to make a model and to draw this out, um, which I believe we did in class. DNA is unzipped by an enzyme called helicase. This is going to break those hydrogen bonds around into double helix. A new enzyme called DNA polymerase will attach to each strand and will add the correct nucleotides from the cell. And so start building the new strands. It's also checking it and eventually you'll have identical copies. It's actually quite more complicated than that because there is the anti-parallel, like the highways going in different directions. Um, and if you'd like to learn about uh, the more complicated nature of DNA replication, there's some great videos on the DNA Learning Center and on HHMI. Um, you can ask me and it's something that we study in depth in AP Biology. 
you have so much DNA that it has to start at uh, hundreds of places along the DNA molecule in order to do this in time. Um, and so in eukaryotic cells, there's going to be many origins of replication. And it's going to move in both directions. Prokaryotic cells have just one circular strand of DNA. Um, I know we haven't gone over cells very much. Prokaryote just means bacteria. And it means a cell that doesn't have a nucleus. It, just it does have DNA, but it doesn't have a nucleus. Here would be your cells. Your DNA is more linear. And so um, there's going to be multiple points where it's starting to copy in these replication bubbles and work until it's done. All right, what role does that DNA polymerase play? Pause the video. Okay, this is a famous experiment called the Messelson and Stahl experiment. We unfortunately didn't get to it this year in introductory biology. They grew E. coli in a heavy nitrogen isotope. Think about it, nitrogen is in those bases in the DNA. They then checked it after one generation of uh, growing in, in N14, a lighter isotope, and they saw that they all came out at 14.5. In a second generation, they saw that it all came out that half of it came out in 14 and half of it came out in 14.5. And unfortunately, I messed up. I don't have the picture of it in here, but it's because semi-conservative. So if the original strand was red, you would have um, two reds here and then a red and an orange where my thumb is. Then if you copied it again, you'd have another red, orange, uh, or the original red, orange, and then two oranges in the middle. Um, that was kind of a lackluster explanation. I unfortunately can't add it in right now in my video. So check out the Messelson and Stahl experiment. All right, let's go through protein synthesis. Messelson and Stahl uh, for Tazen students is not on your assessment. So this is important, right? We're going from DNA to RNA to protein. And so that's what happened with David, right? He couldn't get the DNA didn't code for a functional RNA, which didn't code for the right protein. So genes are coded uh, DNA instruction and control the production of proteins. When you're looking at me, you're seeing lots and lots of proteins. Sorry for the belt. All right, so this happens in the ribosomes in the cytoplasm. It can either happen attached to what's called the endoplasmic reticulum, or they can be free-floating ribosomes. The chemical that's going to carry this message is called messenger RNA. And the structure of RNA is that it's single-stranded. It's got a uh, sugar called ribose. Um, it has an extra oxygen, and it has U's instead of T's. So can you do the base pairing rule here? Oops. Oh, I thought it would come in. So it should be U-A-U-C-G-C. -C. Remember I told you uh, we just had Valentine's Day that RNA always loves you. All right. C to G and A's go to U's, not T's here. RNA carries the message to the ribosome where proteins are made. So um, I told you that when I got hired at TASM, um, that part of my uh, interview process was to do a mini lesson on protein synthesis. And so I used the analogy of cooking a meal, how DNA might be grandma's cookbook. You don't want to mess up your DNA. You're not going to take the whole cookbook to the store. So the cookbook stays in the nucleus. Um, we're going to take a transcript. We're going to write down the recipe. And the written down recipe is this mRNA messenger, right? It is the transcription of the DNA gene. It contains the same information as the gene instead of uh, the only difference is that it's single stranded. It has U's instead of T's and it's able to leave the nucleus to the nuclear pores. So I go to the store with this uh, recipe in mRNA. I'm able to get the ingredients in uh, the amino acids and put them together to make the meal, which is the protein. So the other um, part of RNA is that there's two other versions besides mRNA. mRNA is what is transcribed from DNA. rRNA is ribosomal RNA, which helps to make up the ribosome. It combines with some proteins and makes ribosomes. These are everywhere in life um, and show uh, the unity of life. tRNA is an RNA molecule that's shaped like a T, just like it sounds like. And it's going to carry the amino acid on top of it. So it's going to be loaded up with an amino acid. It will go to the ribosome and match up with the correct mRNA sequence to help make the protein. So let's see how this happens. So those were the three types of RNA. mRNA, ribosomal RNA, tRNA, transfer RNA. M stands for messenger RNA. Transcription is the process of reading DNA and making the mRNA transcript. 
That is what transcription is. It happens inside the nucleus, and then it leaves to go to the cytoplasm to engage in translation. So let's learn about translation. Right? Oh, good. Here was my slide that I just said. So DNA to RNA is transcription. That takes place inside the nucleus. The mRNA then leaves and goes to a ribosome, and at the ribosome, it is translated to make a protein. Here's my definitions. And then here it is again. This is called the central dogma of biology. Um, there is some exceptions to this, and uh, we have viruses that can go from RNA to DNA and into RNA and protein. But for the most part, this works. So for transcription, translation, protein. And remember that we always need to be able to copy DNA whenever we make new cells. All right, what are those three types of RNA? Do you remember? Okay, let's go over translation. So we have transcribed this gene. We transcribed it with an enzyme called RNA polymerase. I don't know. I don't believe I put that in my slide. So here would be RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase is another kind of ubiquitous enzyme, and it's going to make this RNA strand by reading the DNA, um, which is pretty cool. And then uh, the mRNA transcript is going to lead the nucleus, and it's going to go to a ribosome. The ribosome will actually attach onto the transcript, the mRNA. And here in sets of three, the mRNA will be read, and that's called a codon, and the opposite is an anticodon. It will, re, it will be read by the ribosome and attach those amino acids and then um, make the protein. Right, let me erase this. That was my, my journey into drawing. Zoom drawing has been tough for Mr. Gibney. My wife's more of an artist. Practice that. Here's a good picture of it. So here is the ribosome, and then here would be the codon, so AGU. The anticodon to AGU would be UCA. Notice how it follows the base pairing rules again. And instead of T's, it's going to have U's. This ensures that the correct amino acid is coded for. And so to understand this, you kind of need to be able to read the protein chart. So here's an example, AUG, excuse me, the codon chart. AUG, UAC, that's going to code for methionine. When we read a codon chart, we're just going to look at mRNA. You do need to understand the function of an anticodon because it's important. It's what brings the right amino acid here. Right? Otherwise, it could just match up with anything. GGA is going to pair up with uh, the tRNA that has CCU on the bottom, and it's going to bring glycine. GUU is going to code up with uh, CAA, the anticodon on the bottom, and that's going to bring valine. Here's the chart. So let's look back at these again, right? AUG is the mRNA. This is the transcript, the RNA transcript. A, U, G codes for methionine. You go first, second, third, right? And that's going to start every protein. Then G, G, A, G, G, A codes for glycine. You go for first letter, second letter, third letter. G, G, A codes for glycine. You, of course, don't need to memorize that chart or anything. You will have it on your assessment. G, U, U. G U U codes for valine. You might notice something here. You might notice that oftentimes the third letter isn't as important. In other words, G U C, G U A, and G U G all code for valine. But if you change the first two letters, you're going to get something different, right? You will not get valine. And this is uh, pretty cool. And the reason for this is that there's 20 amino acids, but there's 64 combinations of these three letters. To get that, you do the four letters, A's, G's, U's, and C's, and you do it to the third power. Four to the third, four times four is 16, times four is 64. And so here, so that is why the universal code is, we call that degenerate or redundant that some of them can code for the same thing. That's, that's also known as the wobble hypothesis. We believe that it uh, evolved to help lessen the impact of some mutations. All right, so let's get into mutations now. So hopefully you feel comfortable um, doing the um, uh, transcription and translation. 
Um, an excellent thing to review is the gizmo because it really walks you through it. Um, you can also check out the Jamboard activities we did in class and the other worksheets. So DNA uh, can be changed. It can be mutated. And for instance, a G can be changed to an A. And this could be a point mutation. Like here, cat eat a uh, big hat. Instead of cat eat big rat, the RO is changed to an H. And if that mutation is not fixed, it will be passed on every time that cell divides. So if a mutation happens very early in an organism, like in uh, during pregnancy, they can be passed on to lots of cells. If the mutation happens while the sperm or egg is being made, then that mutation will be passed on to every cell in the baby. And it's, um, you know, it provides for genetic diversity. It provides for the raw material for natural selection. There are different types of mutations. And so there's a substitution where just one letter is changed. There's a frame shift mutation. And this is called an indel, an insertion or deletion. If you insert a letter or delete a letter. And so I did this in class with the cat ate the big rat and uh, took a letter out or added a letter in and you saw how it changed the sentence. So here's some examples of one. Here would be a point mutation. Everything's the same, just changing this T to a C. Um, you can have big changes along a chromosome, like where a whole sections are translocated or changed around. And I encourage you to look up the Philadelphia chromosome for that. And so this is just reviewing substitution, insertions, and deletions. Now this, we, we went over a couple of times, and I feel like you did a really good job with it. There can be a um, silent mutation where it's still going to code for the same thing. So here is the regular DNA, ATG. Here is the mutated one, ATA. It's going to change the RNA from UAC to UAU. If you go all the way back to that codon chart, oh boy, I just forgot it. I had it in my head. UAC and UAU. UAC, UAU, they both code for tyrosine. So it's not going to change the amino acid there. Proteins are bunches of amino acids put together, so the protein will be absolutely the same. This is called a silent mutation. Then if you're, you're playing around in your house and your mom gets mad, she says, stop that nonsense. That would be if you change this lattice letter to uh, C here. And it then makes the mRNA UAG. Well, notice how that codes for stop. UAG codes for stop. Remember that the stop codon is going to cleave or cut off the protein at the ribosome and release it into the cell. So that is a nonsense mutation. It stops the protein. Here, GTG, notice how it changed the first or second letter. And very often, if we change the first or second letter, it's going to change the amino acid. And here it changes it to histidine. This, um, if you want to get into it, it's called a missense. I remember it like a mistake. And this one, it can, uh, because each amino acid is different, some of them are more similar than others. Some of them are polar or charged, and some of them are nonpolar. And then, so it'd be like oil and water. So some of them really don't like each other and or repel each other. Some of them are more compatible. And so if it's a conservative mutation, um, then it's not – going to be changed as much and non-conservative will be changed more dramatically. In this class, we're not going to, uh, you won't be responsible for it. Here's just some, some examples of point mutations that you can look up and learn about. I learned through our um, uh, genetic fertility struggle that I'm actually a Tay-Sachs carrier, which was uh, surprising to me. Um, and then here is uh, an example of insertion and deletion. And then a um, here's a, a uh, nonsense mutation. And then last but not least, um, we've studied sickle cell anemia a fair bit with um, evolution. So here is a great example where valines change to glutamic acid, and it's going to change um, the protein and cause these sickle shapes. And uh, people who are heterozygous for the trait um, will be more fit in a malaria area, um, but those who are homozygous recessive can have uh, sickle cell anemia. So that's how it sticks around. All right, uh, take care. Good luck on reviewing the DNA part. Remember the big picture, right? Um, how does the structure of DNA lead to its function? The function is to pass on genetic material. The structure is how it's set up. Um, and then that genetic material is going to code for proteins. And that's really important. Take care.